Welcome to the Flexible Philosophy Podcast, where we sit down with leading thinkers to talk about the ways that their ideas can be put into practice. I'm your host, Hamza King, and on this episode, I'll be discussing individual ethics and war with Victor Tadros, Professor of Criminal Law and Legal Theory at the University of Warwick, and author of To Do, To Die, To Reason Why, Individual Ethics and War. Thank you for being with us, and we hope you enjoy listening. Many just war theorists claim that the laws of armed conflict, or LOAC, do not reflect the moral considerations determining whether acts of individual combatants during war are justified. Put simply, the laws which govern war do not reflect our moral intuitions about what types of behaviour are permissible when fighting wars. In some cases, morality is more relaxed than law. Under the LOAC, the killing of non-combatants is almost never justified, for example. While many just war theorists believe it can be justified if these non-combatants pose a credible threat. In other cases, the law is more relaxed than morality. Under the LOAC, the killing of combatants is justified even if one is fighting for the unjust side, for example. While many just war theorists believe the killing of combatants is only justified if one is fighting for the just side. In his latest book, To Do, To Die, To Reason Why, Individual Ethics and War, Victor Tadros argues for greater convergence between our moral intuitions on war and the LOAC, whilst making some controversial claims about the distinction between combatants and non-combatants, and the idea that soldiers have a moral obligation to follow the orders of their superiors. Thanks for coming on, Victor. No, well, thank you very much for having me. Now, you've written several books on criminal law, but this was your first book on war ethics. So I'd love to hear what prompted you to write this book. Okay, so uh, when my book on punishment, which is called The Ends of Harm, came out in 2011, and I had quite a long discussion of self-defense. And when I started working on that book, I realized pretty quickly that a lot of the most sophisticated work that was being done on self-defense was actually being done by people who were working on the philosophy of war rather than people who were working on the philosophy of criminal law, which was my main community at that point. And so then I started hanging out a lot more with these war people <laughs> and uh, got pretty interested in those debates. And so I kind of developed some of my views about self-defense from the earlier book and started thinking through what they would mean in the war context a bit more, and then just started writing a lot about war as a result of that. So it's partly just I was hanging out with this really interesting community. It's partly that I'd written a, a lot about criminal law, and I was interested in finding something else. And obviously, you don't want to go less violent. So uh, much, much better to ramp up the violence in your work, make it more significant. And so war is the natural place to go. Uh, given that criminal law is about the most horrible thing that a state does to its own citizens, it was good to find something that was uh, that was even more horrific to think about. <laughs> um, and partly, I'd always been interested in war anyway as a phenomenon. So, you know, I'd read books about war and watched movies about war and so on. So I was just pretty interested in it uh, as a social phenomena. And when I wrote the book, I really immersed myself in reading and thinking about wars. And so I read lots more history books and accounts of people who went to war and watched war movies and and so on. Uh, a lot of that stuff doesn't really figure in the book very much, but it was important to me and kind of like showed me my understanding of the actual practical situation that I was uh, writing about philosophically. Well, we'll get into the work of some of these uh, individuals in the, the war ethics community, as you describe it, a little later on. But um, just in broad terms, then, could you tell me what you were trying to accomplish with your book? We'll get into the details in a little, but just as kind of a general overview. Okay, so uh, obviously, like anyone who's looked at the philosophy journals over the last kind of 15 years or so will see that there's been just a huge flurry of philosophical activity around war. Journals like Ethics and Philosophy and Public Affairs published tons and tons of articles about war. And so one of the kind of like challenges when you're writing about this is to say something new. And the other one is to kind of get outside of the tram lines of the way in which people think about the subject. So you can go down lots of rabbit holes by kind of following the literature. I goes back to the point I made earlier, really, one of the reasons to immerse yourself in the actual subject matter by thinking about the history and, uh, and contemporary wars and so on, is that you then shake yourself out of thinking in those terms quite so much. So one of the things that the book tries to do is to think much more carefully about distributive questions than was true in the ethics of war. So a lot of the people who are working on the ethics of war were interested in kind of the philosophy of self-defense as it had been understood, I guess, really since Judy Thompson's important article on self-defense. It's all about individual rights, liabilities, and duties. And I thought that because war is a large-scale phenomenon, it was also important to think distributively about 
how costs and benefits would be shared across a community where soldiers are fighting for other people, possibly for themselves as well, their families, their political community. And then we're going to think about the relationship between those people and the rest of their community on a fairness basis to understand how liability should be imposed across a community. So that was one important kind of thing that I thought was missing from the war literature. And there's another one which is sort of related, which is that surprisingly, there wasn't that much literature about things like authority, both political authority and authority during war, following orders, all of that side of things. Yeah, there's a little bit of stuff in the war literature about that, but that hadn't been thought about very deeply in the war literature. And finally, I work in a law school and I, uh, and I have a law degree and I even know a little bit of the law. And I felt that a lot of the literature on war, which dealt with the law, was done from a point of view where there was a lack of institutional imagination about how legal institutions could be set up to deal with problems where a lot of people thought that they should be dealt with by altering the law where there's other things that you could do. You can alter institutional frameworks in order to achieve the things that people thought that you should achieve for the law. So they were much more, I think, conservative about changing the law than I was because I thought you could change the law and then you could do other things institutionally to kind of respond to some of the challenges that there might be to changing the law, where other people thought that there just had to be this very strong divergence between the law and morality because otherwise you'd have these terrible consequences. So that was another thing which I thought I could bring to the table which I guess are kind of underdeveloped in the, in the literature. Very interesting. Moving on to some of the claims you make now, I thought it would be good to start by discussing our treatment of soldiers. You mentioned that one of the first groups of people we dehumanise during war is enemy soldiers, because it helps us justify killing and harming them. This callous attitude is on display in war films. Countless German soldiers are killed for the sake of saving Private Ryan, for example, as if their lives were worthless merely because of the side they are fighting for. But there is also a sense in which we dehumanise our own soldiers by failing to recognise the vital contribution they make to keeping society safe and by distancing ourselves from them in an attempt to kind of abdicate ourselves of any responsibility for their actions. Then when these soldiers return home, they are left to manage all their trauma and guilt with little support from the society they have been serving. Now I hardly think this is a fair way of treating these predominantly poor young men, given that it could very easily be one of us in their position. Is this a concern you share? Yeah, so thinking about soldiers as people that we could potentially be, I thought was an important part of the project. And so one of the reasons to read accounts of people actually going to wars and what happens to people when they go to war and thinking, well, look, you're in a community where that could be me or my kids or my uh, my siblings or whatever who, who then join up and think about the kind of like relationship between pre-soldier life and soldier life and then post-soldier life was really important to me in understanding limits to the costs that we can impose on soldiers. And so I tend to think what happens is that as soon as people behave wrongly during war, and especially when people behave really wrongly during war, there's a kind of like massive discounting. You know, it's like these people just don't count at all. They're just not morally important anymore. And my work on punishments always made me extremely skeptical about that idea. So when, I, uh, when I've worked on criminal offending, you know, I've always been extremely sceptical of the idea that you can just discount people as kind of like unimportant or worthless or lacking in significance morally just because they've acted in a seriously wrongful way. I think many people in the philosophy of punishment think that. But in the war literature, it was like, if someone acts badly, it's like they're just, they're just kind of up for grabs for slaughter. And you see that in war movies in a way that I think is very, very unappealing. And uh, so the Taking Private Ryan discussion kind of highlights the thought that, like, look, these people are still people. They may have joined the fight for the Nazis, and that may have been a morally appalling thing to do. But you've still got to think about the significance of their lives as individuals. And just because they've acted in a way that's morally appalling doesn't mean they count for nothing. And uh, the war movies, I think, make it look like they just count for nothing. And so that really comes up in the chapter that I have on aggregation, where some people think, look, if you could save one innocent people by killing any number of people who are posing wrongful threats, you can just go and kill any number. And I always thought when you think about the significance of people's actual lives, people who have periods of their lives maybe where they're morally on the straight and narrow, and then maybe they morally go wrong, and then they start committing wrongful acts and wrongful threats, and then maybe later on in life they might reflect back and think that that's a bad thing that they did. When you think about the arc of someone's overall life, the idea that just acting wrongly during war makes you count for nothing and so you can just eliminate any number of these people to save one innocent person proves really problematic. 
One thing that really kind of brought that home to me in my work really on the, the history of war was thinking about the Mai Lai Massacre, which was a massacre that happened in the Vietnam War. Um, there's a book about it, a long book about it, giving an account of the people that participated. And it turns out that these pretty ordinary college-age kids, the vast majority of them, perhaps even all of them that were in the battalion, participated in this absolutely horrific massacre. And what that shows is that you can move pretty quickly from being morally pretty normal kind of average american to being a horrific killer pretty quickly once once a war starts and i think that's the experience of war is that we turn out i think as individuals to be very morally fragile and it doesn't take very much to turn us into people who are quite appalling when you when you say to your students look if you had a kind of fascist government how many of you would be fascists uh, hardly anyone puts their hand up and when you ask the group what proportion of people they think will be fascists, they say, well, probably about 80%. But no one thinks it's going to be them. Yeah. I said, we're all very vulnerable to this kind of like uh, hideous moral corruption. When you think about it in those terms, then it becomes a lot less appealing to think, oh, well, as soon as we go wrong, we just count for zero. Right. So in a sense, you're advocating for distributing the harms of war more evenly around society. But you also describe there to be a culture of subservience in the military. You say you don't mean subservience in a pejorative sense, but you mean more just a culture where soldiers are encouraged to blindly follow orders without questioning the commands of their superiors. And this is often justified on the grounds that these superiors have practical authority over soldiers. So I just wanted to ask whether you agree that soldiers have a moral obligation to follow the orders of their superiors. I'm not basically an anarchist when it comes to war. So, <laughs> it sounds like it. <laughs> so, so, so I'll, I, you know, I, I think that the arguments that have been offered for uh, the authority of commanders over their subordinates just don't work. <laughs> and uh, so I'm, I'm pretty sceptical about all of that. I tend to think that if you have the evidence that what you're going to do is morally wrong and you're commanded to do something that's morally wrong, then you just shouldn't do it. And sometimes when people make commands, they give you evidence that the thing is morally okay because they might have information that you don't. But you don't need practical authority to give people advice. So to give them just the extra evidence. And so if what commanders are doing is giving people more evidence and say, look, I know stuff that you don't. This is actually the morally right thing to do. Maybe they should do what they're advised to do by their commanders. But that's very different from following a command. They're just following advice about what the information is. It's just a bit like, you know, you go to the doctor and they say to you, look, you know, I think you should take this medicine. And because they know better than you, you might just go and take the medicine without finding out a lot more information about it. But the doctor's not giving you commands. And I think that that's the most that superiors can typically do. Mm, Advice, not commands then. That's right, exactly. So all this shouting, it's all wrong. All wrong, yeah. I suppose um, one might respond here by saying, what, what about the coordination function? the idea that superiors maybe are placed in a way that allows them to coordinate the actions of soldiers in a way that's that's beneficial for their objectives and and that without this uh, moral obligation on soldiers to follow these orders, there might be an issue with different soldiers doing different things without things kind of working in unison. Do you think that's a fair concern? I I think it's really important that soldiers can coordinate. I mean, that's absolutely right. The question is whether you need commands to get coordination, and I don't think you do. So just think about like uh, the idea that we all coordinate when a light flashes green. Um, so when we light flashes green, we all go and take one hill. And when uh, light flashes red, we go and take another hill. So now we're coordinating around the lights. The lights aren't giving us commands, though. They're just giving us an indication where we're all agreeing in advance to follow what the light says. But that's not a kind of authority. And again, I think that commanders can sometimes do that. So they can sometimes act like the flashing light and say... Everyone now take the green hill, and we all ought to take the green hill because now we can all predict that everyone else is going to join up, and otherwise it will it will go wrong. But that is just not a good argument for authority as it's normally understood, where authority normally is understood as giving people duties that they don't have in a way that's not merely just giving them information about what other people will do, but in a way that's kind of decisive on its own. Okay, I take your point. So superiors can offer advice and instructions to soldiers but they cannot confer moral obligations which these soldiers do not already have. Now, moving the discussion away from soldiers and onto civilians, there is growing consensus in international law over non-combatant immunity, a principle which states that it is and should be illegal to target non-combatants in war. This is grounded in the idea that non-combatants are less liable to be harmed or killed than combatants because they cause less harm or pose less of a threat. You've expressed some reservations about this principle. 
So could you tell me when and why you believe it might be justified to target non-combatants? So, as you can see from the discussion we had earlier, I think that it's fair that the costs of war are distributed more widely in a community. And there's different ways of understanding the implications of that idea for the question about how non-combatants get harmed and might be affected during war. So we can focus on different kinds of possibilities here where non-combatants might be harmed. One is they might be harmed as a side effect. And then there's a question about whether we should divert the costs to combatants or non-combatants in the case of side effect harm. So imagine that some combatants are going to be harmed as a side effect or some non-combatants are going to be harmed as a side effect. Do we have a reason to distribute the harm to the combatants when it's a side effect harm? And to that, I'm a bit sceptical. I think we we should generally distribute the costs more fairly between the combatants and the non-combatants for the reasons I offered earlier. Okay. Second kind of case is a case where we harm people in a way that we can call eliminative. So to eliminate a harm is not to use a person as a, as a tool for your end. It's rather just to prevent them from participating in a way that will undermine a threat. So, for example, if, if you attack me and I restrain you by holding your arm, I'm not using you for any end. I'm just preventing you from attacking me. And I might intend harm to prevent you from attacking me, but that's not a using kind of case. It's what we call an eliminative kind of case. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes you could target non-combatants in a way that's just eliminative, at least if we understand non-combatants in the way that it's legally understood to include those people who might participate in um, in supporting a war, but who are not participants in that war. So, for example, people who are working in munitions factories, you could hold people who are working in munitions factories in a way that prevents the war from being executed as effectively because they won't have so many munitions. Could you target people eliminatively to prevent them from building the munitions? Here's an interesting way of thinking about this kind of problem. Towards the end of World War II, there was a debate between some senior uh, Nazi officials about how to use the very young men that they wanted to conscript into the military effort. Some people thought that it was best to put them on the front line, and other people thought that it was best to put them in munitions. People who thought that it was best to put them in munitions thought that there weren't enough weapons on the front line, and so the main thing to do was to build up manufacture. Other people thought that they should go on the front line because the main problem was a lack of soldiers on the front line. So imagine you're thinking about this, and then you think, okay, if they're if they're on the front line, then they're liable to be killed. But if they put in the munitions factory, they're not liable to be killed, even if it's more effective to put them in the munitions factory. So we'll put them in the munitions factory. It's going to advance the war effort more effectively by doing that, and they'll be protected from being killed if the other side abides by the morality of war. So I find that idea very implausible that these people could be more effective in getting the other side killed, and yet could be shielded from being killed as a result of doing this more effective thing because it was further back in the causal chain. I think that's very implausible. And so I tend to think that if you can target people on the front line, you could also target people who are more effective earlier in the causal chain, and that would include some people who are non-combatants. Okay, now final kind of case. Could you target non-combatants in a way that terrorizes a population in order to end the war. Mm -hmm. So could you target um, non-combatants in a way that would cause destruction and death and horror in order to influence the government to give up fighting? And that I'm extremely sceptical about, because I think there's a very stringent principle that you mustn't harm people in a way that uses them for the sake of your ends. And killing people in a way that uses them is extremely difficult to justify. Now, that principle, I think, applies equally to combatants and non-combatants. So I think that it's also very hard to justify killing combatants in order to terrorize other people as well. So here's the kind of example where in the combatant sphere, that principle is going to be important. So imagine that I've got this group of people who are attacking me. They're all combatants on the other side. And there's this one person who's coming towards me who I can just capture without harming them at all. But if I shoot them in the head, then the rest of the unit will be frightened and run away. So I think it's really hard to justify shooting that person in the head when I can capture them, even if it would be effective, because you'd be using that person's death in order to influence other people to run away. And I think this principle against using is very stringent. But I think that principle applies to combatants and non-combatants. 
in practice, it often rules out targeting non-combatants because that's often the main way in which non-combatants get targeted. They get targeted in order to create terror. And that, I think, is impermissible. Okay. Sorry, that's a long and complicated answer. Yeah, no, great. Yeah, I was going to so say, just to unpack some of those points and maybe return to some of the just war theorists um, that you mentioned at the beginning. So on that point about munitions factory workers, I think it was Cecile Faber said that there must be a certain threshold met in terms of the causal contribution that individuals make. And that maybe, for example, tightening the screws on a tank engine or testing soldiers' clothes do not pass the threshold for liable harm. And this view resembles that held by the International Committee of the Red Cross, who've published non-binding interpretive guidelines on legitimate targets of war. These guidelines suggest that a person is liable to be harmed if they participate directly in a war, and if there is a sufficiently close causal relationship between their actions and the resulting harm. The phrase participate directly is qualified by requiring that the harm they cause is quote-unquote brought about in one causal step. Do you think this sort of language offers a firm basis for international law? So the first thing to say about that phrasing is if anyone can tell me what one causal step is supposed to mean I have no idea what that is. I was wondering myself. I mean I can go to someone who can tell me that there's some robust metaphysics Mm. about what one causal step is supposed to mean. I mean like you know think about like you know um, uh, driving to someone's house. So that will get me there. Is that one causal step or several causal steps? Well, I've got to press the pedals, turn the wheels, turn the key, and so How many red lights? Yeah. Causal steps, or are they, or is it just one causal step with lots of different bits? Mm. So, like, this phrase is just meaningless. The phrase one causal step is just completely meaningless. Mm. But is now, it there's a different idea, which is like there's some kind of notion of proximity mm. which we should abide by, where if people are kind of proximate, then we can um then we can target them to prevent them from executing their threats and if they're not proximate then we can't now as a rule of thumb it's not actually that bad that idea because it's often really hard to know when someone's really far back in the causal chain whether they're really going to make any difference and so you might think look if someone's pointing a gun at your head it's pretty obvious that you're gonna have to do something to prevent yourself getting shot when the person's just manufacturing the gun there's a lot of other things that have to happen in between that and the gun being shot for the realisation of the threat, and we don't know that they're going to happen. Maybe someone's going to drop the gun, maybe it won't be manufactured, maybe it will be sold to someone who doesn't use it, and so on. So there's lots of epistemic stuff that you might think that this kind of principle captures, which is not that bad. But the idea that it's necessary that the person should be near in the causal chain, I think, is way too strong. So think about like someone who is manufacturing suicide belts in, uh, in an armed conflict, where we now extremely confident that those suicide belts will get used in the conflict. Is it really true that you can't target the manufacturers of the suicide belts? That doesn't seem too plausible to me. Well, think about the case where, I, I think I discussed this in the chapter, I can't remember, it was an example which was in my head at the time anyway. There were people who were stealing oil tankers and they were going to drive them into civilian areas in the conflict and then blow them up. Because it was really hard to prevent this from happening if you had to do it when they were just about to be driven into these areas, partly because shooting them would make them explode. So now, if you could shoot people to prevent them from stealing them, and that was the only way in which you could prevent them from being stolen, is it really true that you can't do that on the grounds that you're not quite sure that these things are going to be set off in a way that will kill thousands of people if they get set off? Again, doesn't seem too plausible to me. Or a final example, think about the efforts of the Nazis to develop a nuclear weapon, which there were efforts, there were scientists who were involved in that, would it be permissible to target the scientists? Well, now, the probability of the nuclear weapon being developed and fired off is quite low, you might think, but the effects are absolutely enormous. So would it be permissible to target the Nazi scientists who are trying to develop the nuclear program? I think probably yes. Mm. I see what you mean. I mean, I'll just maybe put you on the spot here and just say, if we're, if we're not using the phrase brought about in one causal step, any suggestions for, for a maybe more encompassing phrase, uh, a soundbite, or sort of brought about in a... In a relevant step or <laughs> well it's tricky because i mean the underlying issue is really as I, you know, if i'm right that exactly where you are in the causal chain doesn't really matter mm. what really matters is the confidence Contra- you have and the size of the threat yeah you know what we really want to say is you know you can only be targeted if the probability that you you'll make a contribution to a killing is high or that the probability is relatively low but the result will be really devastating So that's what we really want people to kind of abide by. We want to think, look, don't shoot people if you think there's a good chance that they're not really going to make a contribution, so shooting them will be pointless. Or if you think that 
although there's a low chance you can shoot them if you think, oh, there's a low chance, but the results will be catastrophic if they're realized. That's the kind of principle you really want people to abide by. And the yep. causal thing is just an extremely clumsy and bad way of trying to kind of capture those considerations if those are the things that matter. Yeah, it's less about the causal chain, more about the size of the contribution and the, and the likelihood that it will happen. Exactly. Right, well, keeping on this point about international law, there has been much debate around the use of human shields in recent months following the ongoing conflict in Gaza. The Israeli government has accused Hamas of using Palestinian civilians as human shields in order to deter the Israeli Defense Force from responding to the atrocities which Hamas committed on October the 7th. The Israeli government has repeatedly claimed that responsibility for the deaths of these innocent Palestinian civilians rests solely with Hamas. Do you agree? Yeah, so some people think something like this. If a person's being used as a human shield and the only way to defend myself is to shoot through them, then the responsibility will fall on the person who's using them as a human shield. And so it won't count that heavily against my shooting them. So imagine that, like, you've got this person who's coming towards me, they've got a human shield in front of them, they're going to kill me if I don't do anything. But the only way for me to kill this person is to shoot through the human shield. And in order to make it a better case, we should try and equalize the numbers. So suppose that this killer is going to kill both me and someone else. Okay, can I shoot through the human shield in order to kill this person? Or is that impermissible? Okay, so one question about that kind of case is just how strong the moral constraint against shooting through the person really is. This person's not being used now. I'm just shooting through them. I'm not trying to use them. So it's not like I'm treating them as a means. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I'm extremely skeptical about the view that because this other person's using them, my responsibility is somehow diminished. So I think that if I'm going to save the greater number by doing it, maybe I'm permitted to do it. But what I'm not permitted to do is to treat this person's life as less important in my moral calculation on the basis of the fact that someone else has put them in harm's way. And so it's not now my fault that they get harmed. And that kind of rationale is one you see often politically. I mean, you see this in the current Israeli conflict in Gaza. The, you know, the argument sometimes goes, look, these people are being put in harm's way by Hamas. And so if they get harmed, that's on Hamas, it's not on us, the Israeli IDF who are killing these people. And I think that kind of line of argument is completely mistaken. So I don't think that my responsibility for harming a person is diminished in any way by the fact that other people are responsible for putting them in harm's way. So there's kind of two different dimensions here. One question is, just how do human shields get us harmed and what's the strength of the moral constraint against harming them? And the answer to that might be, look, they're not used as a means. They're not mere side effect cases. There's somewhere in between. Sometimes people call them like riding roughshod kind of cases. So the, the, you might think the constraint on harming them is stringent, but not as stringent as the constraint against terrorism, for example. And on the other hand, there's this question about responsibility and what difference that makes, to which I'm very sceptical that it makes any difference. Very interesting. Um, so would you say that perhaps the IDF are responsible for their actions in shooting the person, but also that Hamas would share some responsibility for their actions in terms of using that individual? So there's maybe blame on both sides, but none of that blame rests on the individuals that are used or, you know, that are quote unquote human shields. It's not there. I mean, I'm assuming that it's not their fault. I mean, yeah, it's, of course, yeah, we they can. put themselves in harm way, then That's they different. be responsible. But yeah. let's take that out of the equation. I suppose that they're forced into this position, so they don't have any choice, like the people who are in the hospitals that, that Israel claim that Hamas are hiding under the hospitals and so on. So this is not yeah, that they can't do fun. anything about it, I suppose. Yeah. Okay, so you're right to say, of course, that when these people are killed, then Hamas are responsible for their deaths. And then I just say, look, it's also true that the IDF are responsible for their deaths. And then you might think, oh, look, there's a problem here because there's only a certain amount of responsibility to go around. And my answer to that is, look, there isn't. Responsibility is, uh, there's this really nice paper by um, Alex Kaiserman at Oxford. It's called uh, something like responsibility and the pie fallacy. He says, look, responsibility is not like a pie, where if someone takes a slice of responsibility for an outcome, other people can't have as much responsibility for that outcome. Everyone can be fully responsible for the outcome. And that's how I think of this kind of case. It's true that Hamas are fully responsible for the deaths because they know what's going to happen to these human shields. It's also true that the IDF are fully responsible for the deaths. They don't get shielded by Hamas's responsibility. Yeah, thanks. It's a really refreshing view.
So there's been a lot of disagreement over how the costs of war should be shared and the extent to which civilians should bear the cost of war. Popular view is that innocent civilians should bear no cost for their actions uh, and that most of the cost should be placed on governments and, and perhaps soldiers. Would you agree with this view? Well, given my views about the sharing of the harms of war, you could expect me to also say that we should sometimes share the costs of war as well. So uh, when it comes to uh, you know, the financial costs, for example, of repairing a country after a war, which are often extensive, then the country that's acted unjustly, I think, might bear a greater proportion of those costs than the international community. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to sharing those costs within the community, I don't think that soldiers should bear a particularly heavy part of those costs. This is a bit like another kind of vicarious liability type of case. That things might be different where the combatants are um, completely opposed to their population or their population um, is not being protected by those combatants at all. So you think about like um, Jewish people in Nazi Germany. Could Jewish people in Nazi Germany be expected to be, pay some of the reparations that Nazi Germ- that, that the Germans owed as a result of the war? Definitely not. It's not like these people were protecting Jewish people in Nazi Germany, and so they can't bear any of the costs. And there's an interesting question about what you should think about Hamas and Palestinians in that context as well, given that Hamas almost certainly substantially disadvantaged the um, the Gazans that they claim to represent. Um, do those Gazans then, are they required to bear any of the costs as a result of Hamas's wrongful actions? It's less clear because they are not uh they're not benefiting them and so if my argument about benefit goes through it might actually have implications in some current real world context as well so i tend to think the costs can be shared reasonably widely amongst those people who are protected and benefited by people acting in the combatant role and then there's going to be limits on that because not everyone is benefited and protected by people in the combatant role Mm, brilliant Uh, and another way of kind of responding to the atrocities of war is, is through the use of institutions. And I was just wondering if you can maybe outline your views on what you think may be the most effective ways that institutions can respond to these atrocities and, and the role that they play in preventing them from happening in the future. It's extremely hard, this question, and there's really a dilemma here. So on the one hand, it's really important that individual accountability is front and central. Yeah. That people don't just want... Um, an account of what happened. They want individuals to be held responsible for the terrible things that they did. And I think that's actually a a fundamental idea that is really important that we do hold individuals accountable. They have a story to tell in their own voices. They're not just part of a historical narrative. They're individuals who've made decisions who we can expect to respond to what they've done. So we want to try and set up conditions where individual accountability can be realised. And in order to do that, we need lots of protections, trial-type protections and ability to respond to accusations and so on, because otherwise individual accountability is going to look problematic. But in armed conflict, we're talking about large numbers of people, and so doing that in a way that is widespread enough to really tackle the wrongdoing that's occurred during war will be extremely time-consuming and expensive. And then there's this other kind of mechanism, like a kind of truth and reconciliation type of mechanism, uh, like this sort of thing that uh, was done in South Africa after apartheid. And that kind of mechanism doesn't try and hold people accountable as individuals, but just tries to provide an account of the truth, still by getting people to talk in their own voice. But now getting to the respond appropriately and full accountability is not really part of the ambition there. And that's very problematic in not really getting accountability in the right way with the right kinds of protections. But it can do better in terms of kind of getting a sense of the overall scope, even if often it will be inadequate because you won't really get the kind of individual responses that people really want from wrongdoers. And also there'll be lots of subverting of the system as there was in the in the South African system where people just kind of turned up and said a few things and then went away again without a proper kind of like real involvement in the process, just because that was what was needed to escape from a prosecution. And so what you've got is this real dilemma where you don't really have a kind of um, a fully acceptable mechanism. Anything which gives the proper protections you need for a really fully fledged accountability mechanism will be too expensive and too demanding in terms of time for you to really do it for the large number of the people that are involved in a war. But anything less than that will have all these problems. They will be inadequate. And my sense is that like something which leans towards the first thing with f- slightly fewer protections, but still 
involves a bit more individual accountability might be the best thing that you can achieve here. But there's always going to be some compromise, I think, between these two poles. You're going to have to try and set up mechanisms which try and achieve a bit of both of these things, and there's going to be some tension and compromise in doing it. So you're never going to get a perfect system here, and there's always going to be disappointment. Yeah, as is the case often with war ethics, you're kind of caught between a rock and a hard place. That's exactly it. Well, look, I really appreciate you coming on, Victor. It's been great hearing your views on these issues, especially with everything that's going on in the world right now. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. If you're interested in the deeper philosophical questions around war ethics, subscribe to our newsletter for an extended interview, where Victor and I discuss the method of cases and the ways that we should hold soldiers accountable for their conduct. 